Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Amy Spreeman. And I'm Michelle Leslie. And it's that time again. It's time for another episode of Glad You Asked. To prepare for these episodes, we put out the call for questions on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. So if you want to submit a question, be sure you're following us on one of those platforms. And since there are other ministries that also go by the name A Word Fitly Spoken, one of which which I think is Mormon. Um, oh, we, no. <laughs> yeah, we would encourage you to stop by our website, a wordfitly spoken dot life, to get the direct links for each of our social media pages, and those are conveniently just right there on the homepage of the website. Yes, and before we get started tonight, we want to send a big thank you out to Mayoshi for increasing her donation to A Word Fitly Spoken on Patreon. Thanks so much, Mayoshi. You know, it does cost a lot of money to podcast, and we couldn't do what we do here without financial support uh, from our listeners. So if you'd like to support us like Mayoshi does, you can get all of our information at the support tab on our website, A Word Fitly Spoken dot life. Yes, and thank you so much, Mayoshi. She has been a loyal supporter for a long time, and we really, really appreciate her. And thanks so much to all of our donors. We are so grateful for your kindness and generosity. And listeners, we are also glad you asked so many great questions for this episode. So let's get to it. Amy, what's our first question? All right. So the first question comes from an anonymous listener on Facebook, on our Facebook page. And she writes this. I know most Christians end up working in secular spaces, and not every believer will work around people who have the same beliefs as them. So at what point does it become necessary for a believer to leave their jobs? Is it when they are directly asked to sin, or if their workplace openly celebrates or even partners with people who advocate for and support things like abortion or the LGBTQ? And I can tell you, uh, anonymous listener, that I know exactly where you're coming from, and I can offer uh, just this little bit of advice. It seems like you know this, but for the benefit of listeners who might need to hear it, we are here in the world, but not to be of the world. Jesus prayed for his disciples and for those who would come after them. In in this prayer in John 17 that you can read about, he expressed that uh, his disciples were not of this world any more than he was. And then he prayed, not that God would take them out of the world, but that he would protect them while they were in it. So this prayer uh, does make it clear that we are in this world, but not of it. But what does that mean exactly? Well, it includes not behaving in any way that does not glorify God. If we are in a workplace that becomes increasingly hostile to Christians, then we know that it's probably time to leave that environment. But what if the workplace doesn't seem hostile, but embraces the sinfulness that the world's celebrating these days? This is going to take really, ladies, prayerful consideration, because while we're not to ever wink or nod at sin, we are to be loving and kind toward everyone. Do you work side by side with a woman living with her boyfriend? Do you have customers or clients who take the Lord's name in vain? Do you have homosexual bosses or work with people who sleep around or have abortions or cheat on their spouses or take their kids to drag shows, etc.? You are to show kindness and respect to all. Without agreeing with or appearing to agree with any type of behavior that God calls sin, Now, they are oblivious to the things of God and cannot spiritually discern these things. There are worldly people working in worldly places, and the mission statements of most of these organizations, unfortunately, are now going toward the ever-popular diversity, equity, and inclusion model. You'd be hard-pressed to find employers who don't do this. If you're ever asked to compromise in your work, uh, to participate in pride events, or to sign a statement saying that you agree with an ideology that you do not believe in, well, no job is worth losing your witness or your your soul, frankly. If you're asked simply to not discriminate, then you're still able to work there without compromising as long as you can continue to bring God glory. Now, I will say that some days it's going to feel just like it's really a good idea to just not argue, fly under the radar, you know, that kind of thing. Just get your work done. But other days you might need to take a stand. 
But to get through this, you're going to need to be walking daily with God in his word, praying always for wisdom in how and when you engage in the workplace and for grace in shining your light before everyone you work with. Do they see Christ in you? If you were to die tomorrow and they, you know, all went to your funeral, would they be surprised to learn that you are a Christian? Be that light of hope that points the way to Christ always. That's my thought. Michelle, any thoughts on that from you? Yeah, I think that your advice was just so, just right spot on. And uh, I really appreciate you bringing that passage in John 17 out. That's a really good uh, passage to meditate on. Um, the only thoughts, other thoughts that I have are, you know, you obviously, just in case this isn't obvious to someone, you, if you're a woman who's married, you really need to talk this over with your husband and make sure he's apprised of what's going on every step of the way, uh, because he may, you know, he may decide that he wants you to quit before you think about quitting or something like that. Uh, you could get yeah. some counsel from your pastor about this or a godly older woman at church whose, whose opinion that you respect. Um, and so, and also, uh, just think about the fact that there's, there's nothing sinful about looking around for other jobs. You know, um, even if you had the greatest job in the world, you might need a job that had fewer hours or you might need a job that was closer to your house or anything like that. And that wouldn't be sinful, you know, if you're looking for another job for those reasons. So it's not sinful to look at other jobs for, for the reason that, you know, you're uncomfortable at your workplace and, and changing jobs for that reason is, is not sinful. So it doesn't hurt to look around and, you know, perhaps the Lord will send a job your way where you would be more comfortable in your workplace and not having yeah. to face things like that every day. So that's, that's just something to think about too. Amen. And I wasn't, uh, wasn't sure if this uh, anonymous listener was uh, married right. or not, but uh, very good advice. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, our next question uh, isn't really a question, but a somewhat critical review from a listener who's not completely satisfied with her a word fitly spoken experience. Oh, no. Well, hmm. yeah. Well, we aim to please God, that is. We aim to please God. And we're certainly open to, to kind and constructive suggestions of ways that we can improve. So let's hear what she had to say. This listener left us a three-star review out of five stars on iTunes, which I thought was generous considering her subsequent comments. And she did she did write this very kindly. She wasn't ugly or anything like that. All right, here's what she said. She said, my complaint would be the introduction music. It sounds like music used in inappropriate movies. Bad trigger for me. And even though I listen to your program regularly, I still feel the music is terrible. The constant putting down of others also saddens my heart. There are many deceivers in our world, but as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit that leads us and gives us discernment. It would be refreshing to hear positive things about people you do agree with. When reviewing the real truth over and over, the counterfeit is easily exposed. The constant nagging about the negative just makes me want to turn you off. Okay, so there's a lot to address here. Uh, let me, as gently as I possibly can, in love, in kindness, start off with the elephant in the room, hypocrisy, because this is a good teaching moment for, for all of us. The first two words of her comment are, my complaint. And then she says, our music is terrible. And she sums things up by char characterizing us as constantly putting others down and constantly nagging about the negative. See what I'm getting at here? Putting others down, nagging about the negative. That's what she says we're doing while doing the very same thing herself towards us. Now, I'm pointing this out not to say that Christians can never offer constructive criticism to fellow Christians, but to help us see that we need to become more self-aware when we do. Are we guilty of the sins we point out in others? Well, that's hypocrisy. Matthew 7, 1 through 5 is a great mirror to look into before we confront someone else. It teaches us how not to judge hypocritically. Here's what it says. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. 
Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And I think we could all stand to meditate on that passage more often. I know I could. All right, now let's deal with this. some of this listener's specific issues. Okay, she says, the introduction music sounds like music used in inappropriate movies. Okay, I get that. At some point in your life, you've seen an inappropriate movie or movie trailer that used that kind of music, and that's what you associate with that style of music. But you have to understand that's your personal, subjective, visceral reaction to that style of music. I can't speak for everyone else who hears it, but for me, it's just a clip of music with a sort of uh, Zydeco bluegrass flavor that I associate with the area I live in, South Louisiana, which I love. I mean, I hear that clip and I don't think inappropriate movie. I think crawfish boils and street fairs with friends and family. That's my personal subjective visceral reaction to that style of music, and it's not any more right or wrong than yours. About a year ago, maybe a little more, I um, I opened up the floor for debate on our bumper music because we'd gotten a lot of comments about it. And I, I posted a Facebook uh, post about it that well over 100 people responded to. Now, I didn't crunch the numbers, but I would estimate that about 95% of respondents said they either liked our music or they didn't care one way or the other about our music. I don't want to speak for Amy, but I'm not married to that bumper music. I mean, if y'all feel strongly about it, here's what I want you to do. Find us something else or compose and record something high quality for us and send it to us and we'll consider it. Uh, but we have a few requirements. Here's here's the first requirement. First of all, it has to be free so we can keep our expenses down. Second, it has to have a unique sound. I mean, I listen to a lot of Christian podcasts and they all have basically the same boring, generic sounding contemporary bumper music. Ours is different. That's one of the reasons I like it. Um, and number three, it has to be public domain. We don't want to mess with copyright issues and we're not paying royalties. So, you know, you can do all those things. Or if you don't want to do all that, just keep hitting fast forward whenever the music comes on. All right. Next, she says, the constant putting down of others also saddens my heart. There are many deceivers in our world, but as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit that leads us and gives us discernment. Well, yes, and one of the ways that the Holy Spirit does that is through doctrinally sound discerning Christians like Amy and me teaching and warning about false teachers and false doctrine. And that's a completely legitimate form of biblical teaching, not putting others down. And we will joyfully and unapologetically continue to teach that way to the glory of God, just like Jesus did and the Old Testament prophets and the apostles. In fact, if you remove from your Bible all of the passages that deal with false teachers and false teaching, you'd be removing a pretty big chunk of Scripture. And not only is our discernment teaching not putting others down, it's not constant either. I mean, case in point, our two most recent episodes were on building a biblical women's ministry in your church. Before that, we posted episodes on voting, Reformation Day, and scriptures governing Christians' participation in Halloween. How is that constantly putting others down? I, I just don't understand that. Uh, and then she says, it would be refreshing to hear positive things about people you do agree with. Okay, uh, I'm I'm honestly just baffled by this. Have, have you never listened to any of our interview episodes? Do you not hear the recommendations that we make in our episodes and in the show notes of our episodes? Or the kind comments and encouraging reviews from listeners that we read on the show? I mean, those are positive things about people we do agree with. So this is a little baffling to me. Uh, Amy, do you have any thoughts about this listener's complaints? No, I think you summed it up, Michelle. Um, and that music, as I've said before, was from the free library in GarageBand, uh, where I uh, mostly edit our podcast. I use a few other programs as well, but GarageBand has a little uh, library that I can pick from. And I have heard others use it. Actually, one other podcaster used it uh, one time, but not very many, though. It is still pretty unique. Um, and I agree. I thought it had a nice southern twang to it, which is, you know, Michelle's region of 
of the country. So um, I, I will say that if we picked a Wisconsin tune, it would probably sound more like polka, uh, which I was raised on and which would probably offend a lot of people just listening to it. Hey, hey, I like polka. I know I like polka. It well, wouldn't offend Michelle, me. Michelle, not if you actually <laughs> listen to the words of the tunes. Polka has words. I usually just hear it as an instrumental. Yeah, it's more You're than just dancing me. tunes. No, <laughs> I, I'd sing a few for you now, but that would also be offensive. And, uh, you know, you, no one wants to hear that. Oh, well, let's so. not do that. Okay. We'll get more complaining um, comments on our reviews. Uh, but yeah, and maybe somebody will record something for us. That would be really sweet. But, you yeah. know, we do say a lot of encouraging things about people who are faithfully proclaiming and teaching God's word, I will say. But yeah, when it comes to warning, ladies about those who teach false doctrine or twist scripture into a pretzel, we do need to call it out. We don't say mean things or insulting things about them personally. In fact, I remember, um, you know, when we did our series on uh, false teachers and talked about Beth Moore, we talked about how beautiful she was and entertaining and that sort of thing. But then we said, but we do have to take issue with what she teaches and how she teaches. So we do need to unapologetically, without hemming and hawing or wringing our hands, speak the truth. I mean, how would you speak about someone who has the neck of your child in their jaws? Well, that's how God feels when his children are about to be torn to shreds by wolves. I mean, that, you know, that it's that serious. So uh, we do need to talk about that. All right. So let's get to our next question. And it is from our Instagram page. And this is, uh, I love this name of this person, Theology Introvert. (laughs) So uh, (laughs) Theology Introvert writes, I know God wants us to be content with what we have and be grateful. How does that conflict or does it with wanting our home to be as good as it can be, i.e. home renovation projects such as a new bath or kitchen? Is it just Christian liberty or should we just deal with what we have if what we have works? Well, that's a great question. Thanks for writing Theology Introvert. I love that name. (laughs) Uh, Let's start with the verse about contentment uh, that I think you might be referring to for those who are unfamiliar. Uh, Paul writes about it several times. But um, I I first go to uh, Philippians 4.10, where he writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now at length, you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So the thing is, um, many people aren't content with what they already have, right? And so we're driven to want more and more and more uh, just because of the consumeristic uh, culture we live in. Nothing satisfies. It's not until we taste the goodness of God that we understand that satisfaction is found in Christ and the things of the kingdom of God and not in the materialistic things of this world. Through contentment, we develop godly character and we see our finances as a way to bless others and honor God. Now, having said that, we can hold all things in proper perspective and not make an idol out of them. Um, I'll give you an example. When I was a young wife, long time ago, I became obsessed with home improvement shows. You know, the shiny countertops of granite, uh, the cute cupboards and the fun Pinteresty things around the house all the things we could not afford. And I definitely made an idol out of them. In fact, I sometimes would throw those cute things from Sears on a credit card. And that kind of thinking and behaviors uh, that it led to was not honoring to God. I needed to repent of that. You know, home purchases and even home remodeling projects really aren't sinful in themselves, if you think about it. If you're replacing things that are worn out or dated or, you know, even though they work fine, if you're not idolizing that stuff and you can afford it without taking away from what you're providing for your family or your church or others you're helping, and you're not getting in over your head in debt, well, that's not sinful. But I would say spend wisely and really be in prayer about everything, including your finances. You know, of course, um, it goes without saying you're going to want to be in one mind with your husband about those things. Don't put things on, on your credit card that you shouldn't without, you know, him knowing about that. 
And know that even the prettiest home will not satisfy or provide contentment. Michelle, what do you think? Well, I think that's a really unique question, and and it really just points to the fact that um, we need God to be Lord over every single thing in our lives. And so yes. I'm really glad she asked that. Uh, Miss Theology Introvert, maybe I can throw in a couple of perspectives that you may not have thought of or that you can consider as you're prayerfully deciding what would be the wisest and most God-honoring thing to do. My husband is self-employed in the field of home and business maintenance, and he does renovation type work from time to time. So do think about Mm -hmm. how best to be content and honor God with your money and your home, but also consider that um, that when you hire somebody like my husband, you're giving that person work so he can support his family and you're contributing to the health of the economy as well. And those, those kinds of things can also honor God. And then another thing you might want to consider is that there, uh, there are sometimes when you do a renovation, there are some things that can be salvaged and donated. Uh, I don't know. We have this store around here. It's called Restore. I forget. That's not the whole name, but it's called oh. Restore. Store. Yeah, we have those. You have yep. those? Okay. And so you can take and donate like uh, useful lum- lumber that's still useful, or I think you can even donate things like a, a used sink or vanity and, and things like Definitely. that. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, donating those, th- and I believe what they use those things for is to uh, to either sell to people who are sort of low income and are working on their own homes, or maybe to help build uh, homes for lower income people. So that might be, yeah, yeah, that might be something you can look into and consider as well um, when you're considering renovating. All right, next, I've got three quickie questions that I think we can address fairly speedily. These first two come from our Facebook page. Miyoshi asks, should every church have an organized women's ministry? If so, who should organize it? So I think this question came about as a result of the release of part one of our two-part miniseries on women's ministry, but it was asked before the release of part two. So the first thing we want to do is encourage you, Miyoshi, and all of our listeners, if you haven't had a chance to listen to both parts of that little miniseries on women's ministry yet— Go listen to those. Um, I think we sort of indirectly answered these questions in part one, but let's go ahead and answer them directly. No, every church should not have an organized women's ministry. There are churches that have too many other activities going on, churches that are going through some sort of crisis that need to shut all their programs down for a while, churches that are so small that an organized women's ministry isn't feasible. There are any number of reasons why any given church shouldn't have an organized women's ministry. This is something you need to look at on a church-by-church basis. And then who should organize an organized women's ministry? I think that's going to vary from church to church as well. Uh, Maybe the pastor or an elder will get the ball rolling and set things up, or maybe God will put it on the heart of a woman in the congregation. Um, If God puts it on your heart, pray about it for a bit, and then go talk to your pastor or an appropriate elder about it. Amy, got any thoughts on that first quickie question? Well, not on the question itself, but uh, just to bring up, I also had a comment from someone else reacting to our podcast that I posted, and she said, you know, there is no such thing as women's ministry in Scripture. It's just not there. All teaching and guidance commanded of women is done informally in times of natural fellowship. Any official ministry led and taught by women, which usually includes an elected or appointed ministry leader, that would be a minister, is forbidden. And this lie largely is responsible responsible for the effeminate theology which has overtaken the church. So that was the comment that I got, uh, which obviously I do not agree that teaching women what is good and showing them how to study God's word is something sinful in a church setting. You know, women teaching women in a Titus 2 sense, including the truth of the Bible and, you know, what it teaches and how it teaches them to be godly, that's the opposite of feminism. You know, we, we've dealt with this idea before, this pushback, and it really really is a misunderstanding, and it places a command really where there is no such statement by Paul. So just wanted to remind ladies that women's ministry in itself is its definitely not unbiblical. We should be studying what is good and learning about God's Word. So there you go. Absolutely. Yeah, do go back and listen to both of those parts 
uh, two parts yes. on women's ministry, those two two episodes, and then also go back and listen to our episode um, called Titus Te- Titus Two: Teach What Is Good, and we'll yeah. try to remember to stick a link in in the show notes for that one. <laughs> Okay, our next quickie question comes to us via our Facebook page, and it's from Brandy. She asks, what would your advice be to someone doubting their salvation? Well, three things, Brandy. First, I would recommend that you go back to the biblical gospel, go through it, and make sure that's what you believe. One great way to do that is to work your way through the materials at our website, a word fitly spoken dot life at the good news tab. We've got the whole plan of salvation laid out there for you with the appropriate Bible verses, plus some other really good gospel materials. Then second, assuming that you're a member of a doctrinally sound local church, set up an appointment with your pastor for counsel on this. Amy, I'm going to keep beating this drum until the cows come home, because a lot of Christians don't know that giving pastoral counsel to church members is part of their pastor's job and biblical calling. And for a lot of pastors, it never occurs to them that their church members don't know that. So we're going to just keep on making sure that everybody knows all about that. So set up an appointment with your pastor. You know, explain your anxieties and questions and maybe have him go over the gospel with you, too. If you aren't a member of a doctrinally sound local church, find one pronto and set up an appointment with your new pastor. We'll put a link in the show notes to help you get started. And if there's some sort of extraordinary situation that prevents you from getting into a doctrinally sound church immediately, you could also try a um, certified biblical counselor. And we've got a link for that in the show notes, too. And then finally, do a deep dive on the study, a uh, deep dive study on the book of First John. Let the Holy Spirit reveal to you through His Word whether or not you're saved. Yes. Assurance of salvation is what John tells us his letter is for in chapter 5, verse 13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Mm, love that. Yeah, it's a great verse. If you need some help studying, um, check out my Bible study on 1 John called Am I Really Saved? A 1 John Checkup, and also Amy's Naomi's Table Bible Study, A Study in 1 John. Maybe study through 1 John on your own and then do each of those Bible studies in addition. And not to sound like a broken record, but we've got links for both of those in the show notes, too. Amy, any thoughts on quickie question number two? I just agree. First John is a great place to go if you want to examine your faith. Um, I'm going to list off a few more Bible verses that tell us that we not only can be assured of our salvation, but that God does want us to know that we have assurance by reminding us over and over again that we can't do anything to earn it. What do you have to do to get saved? Well, John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then Romans 10.13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And John 1.12 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What are you saved from? God's wrath, the penalty for your sin. How many times did Jesus say your faith has saved you? God's mercy and grace saves you by granting you that faith. You can't just conjure that up on your own, not your works or your decision or your good deeds or anything else you do can save you. That is so true. All right. Our final quickie question of the night comes to us from Anonymous over at our Instagram page. And she asks this, Matthew 24, 24, even the elect will be deceived. Does this mean a person was never really saved to begin with? Well, 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us where to rightly handle the word of truth. So whenever you're contemplating a certain doctrine, make sure you go back to the verses that they're based on and read them word for word in context, straight from the text. Sometimes that alone will clear up your confusion. I know that helps me. So let's go to our first text, Matthew 24. Right now, we're going to limit our focus to verses 23 through 24. And this is where Jesus is talking about his second coming and the uh, the end of time. And this is what he says in Matthew 24, 23 through 24. He says, Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. 
For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Did you hear that little phrase, if possible? Jesus is not saying that the elect will be led astray to their damnation, because we know from the preponderance of New Testament scripture that that's not possible. If you've been genuinely born again, it is not possible for you to be deceived to the point that you renounce or lose your salvation. So anybody at the time when these things transpire, anybody who appears to be deceived out of her salvation and faith in Christ by these false Christs and false prophets, as Anonymous has correctly stated in her question, was never genuinely saved in the first place, no matter what they claim. And that's even true of people who have apostatized today. All these people who have supposedly, quote unquote, deconstructed and are now ex-evangelicals, you know, Mm -hmm. and we know that we know that from first john 2 18 through 19 this is what that says it says children it is the last hour and as you have heard that antichrist is coming so now many antichrists have come therefore we know that it is the last hour they went out from us but they were not of us for if they had been of us they would have continued with us but they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. So that makes really clear that people who go out from us, or in other words, who quote unquote leave the faith, I, I don't really like that phrase because you can't really leave the faith. Uh, but when they do, it, it indicates that they are not of us. They were never uh, really saved to begin with. Matthew 10 22 tells us the one who endures to the end will be saved. So yes, if you're deceived by false Christs and false prophets to the point of renouncing your salvation, you are never truly saved in the first place. The devil may have you convinced that you really were saved and you're really leaving Christianity, but the Bible says you're wrong about that. Okay, I guess that question wasn't as quick as I thought it was. <laughs> Amy, uh, I'm sorry about that. Any Any thoughts on that? Well, I I think the questions are quick, but our answers are a little lengthy. (laughs) Uh, But I agree with you. There are a lot of people who are convinced that they are Christians and who are convinced uh, by their words. And we're convinced that they're saved just because what we hear them say. But really, when the rubber meets the road, they fall away like shingles in a tornado and they never come back. They are the tares that look so much like wheat. And it's really hard for us to tell the difference. And, And you know what? That's God's job anyway. Those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life cannot write themselves out of it because they really have a new regenerated heart, and it's really not possible. All right, my thought there. So time for another question. Uh, This one is from our Instagram account and another anonymous person here. A lot of anonymouses today, popular name back back in the day when names were being (laughs) handed out. So uh, I'm just kidding. She writes, I'm 19 and in a new relationship. He is also Christian and he praises God like no other. I've been in relationships before, but none have felt this way. I feel like he is the one. How can I be sure that this is a God thing and not just something that I want? Thank you for all that you do, and I look forward to listening in. Well, Anonymous, love is a beautiful thing, and um, (laughs) I'm so happy for you that it can make you feel so giddy and over the moon, and I'm thrilled that your boyfriend is praising God. Now, without knowing him, we hope that this indicates that he is a born-again, regenerated follower of Jesus Christ. Um, and I, I would not want to throw cold water on you, but sometimes, as we've seen in our uh, Michelle's and my many years on this planet, um, it isn't always the case. People can be full of zeal and seem to be on fire for Jesus, but it just doesn't last. Usually, though, time will tell whether a person's zeal for the Lord is genuine, time and fruit. Um, Also, I would say our feelings also need to pass the test of time because love and romance are not necessarily the same thing. The Bible gives us examples of the differences. Um, For instance, in King Solomon's case, he fell in romance many times, but his downfall came when he let romance and his feelings override following God. 
So when you say that it feels like he's the one, what I think I hear you say is that you hope he's the one you will marry because what you're looking for or what you sh- we all should be looking for is not a boyfriend who seems like a Christian, but a husband who through your marriage will glorify God with you for the rest of your lives. A man who will be by your side and you by his through some of the most devastating and joyous times you will ever face. As you and he get to know each other through your dating or courting relationship, you're going to want to look for the fruit uh, of your future husband. A lot of people will advise you to go to premarital or even pre-engagement counseling. Not a bad idea, but a Christian discipler is going to go beyond the practical things and probe your commitment to spiritual growth uh, with each other. And, you know, this is to make sure that you are evenly matched in your beliefs and your doctrine and your spiritual growth, too. For instance, is he humble and teachable? Are you? You know, the Bible tells us that a righteous or wise man or woman will take instruction gladly, even when it hurts him. Proverbs 9, 9 says, give instruction to a wise man and he will still be wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. Is he willing to be corrected by scripture? Is he honest? Do his actions agree with his words? His character should be one of integrity, too. So you got to think about all those things. Is he selfless? Does he put others first? Your future husband is going to love you as he loves his own body, just like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, as it says in Ephesians 5.25. Is he able and willing to provide for you? Is he able and willing to protect you, not only from danger, but from spiritual harm, from the lies of the enemy, from worldly forces that will, by the way, indoctrinate your children these days? You might be thinking, whoa, it's way too early to be asking each other those questions. But I would say to you that if this is the case, then it's probably too early to be thinking that this is the one. But I do encourage you to ask each other these questions now to make sure that you want to continue down this road. And I hope and pray that this is the one, that the two of you are matched and will grow in Christ and are committed to plan for a marriage that glorifies God in every way. Michelle, anything to add? Yeah, I just I'm sitting here reminiscing about young love and, you know, how how exciting that is. And um, unfortunately, when I was that age, I thought every guy I dated was the one. (laughs) So um, sometimes our hearts can, you know, just overly romanticize things like you were saying. And uh, but I wanted to go back to what you were saying about uh, Christian disciplers. Um, I would mm-hmm. suggest maybe go to your go to your pastor again uh, for some some godly pastoral counsel, and also I'm, I was just thinking maybe see if he can suggest a godly older couple who has been married for you know three or four decades and and has a uh, a successful marriage and a godly marriage, and maybe see if you can start spending mm-hmm. some time with them the the two of you start spending some time with them you know ha- have dinner together. Uh, just have some discussions together and things like that and let them observe the two of you. And uh, and then the the wife maybe can disciple you a little bit and the husband can disciple him a little bit. And the two of them may be able to help you uh, come to a determination of whether or not you should get married. Because uh, sometimes, it, you know, with all those romantic feelings, we really need somebody more objective to help us through things like that. So so that would be a suggestion that that you could take as well. All right. Our final question of the night is from our Facebook page from a listener, another listener who wishes to remain anonymous. And she says, every year, my women's Bible study does a share day before we break for Christmas and the end of the year. I always struggle with this day as women stand up and are supposed to share how the Lord has worked in their lives, but it quickly turns into to very dramatic stories, oftentimes full of tears. I'm not sure if I need a heart change, but I find it a difficult time. Any insights you might have would be greatly appreciated. Well, okay, um, it's kind of hard to say whether you need a heart change or this event needs to be structured in a more biblical way or maybe something else is at play here, but I'll give it a shot. All right, so Christians giving personal testimonies about how God has worked in their lives is a beautiful thing. Assuming it's done right, it glorifies God, 
it encourages the saints, and it gives us even more reasons for praising uh, and rejoicing in God. And it's also okay for people, especially women, but also even men, to get emotional and cry when they're overcome by the magnitude of what God has done for them. I mean, you're talking to someone who frequently bursts into tears during the worship service when we're singing a certain hymn or or reading a particular scripture that relates to what God has been doing in my life that week. I mean, tears are practically a sacrament for me. When when I get to heaven, my mansion is going to need a storage room filled with Kleenex. You dig? <laughs> so that's the kind of person that I am. I mean, I don't cry at the drop of a hat, but when I think about what God has done for me, it's really overwhelming. Mm. Um, so if, you know, if that's the kind of thing that's going on, I would encourage you to just have some understanding for that, even though maybe that's not the way God has uniquely wired you and you don't tend to cry a lot. Or if you're not comfortable crying in public or, or whatever, that's okay. That's the way God made you. But do embrace the fact that God made other people different from you, and that's okay too. We don't want to live our lives being led around by the nose by our feelings or, or make decisions based on our feelings instead of Scripture. But it's okay to have feelings and express those feelings in a biblical way. And crying because you're so in awe of what God has done is certainly a biblical expression of feelings. Now, on the other hand, there could be another dynamic at play here. Perhaps only women with dramatic stories are sharing, and that's leading women who have more ordinary stories of God's grace to clam up. Well, here's what you can do to help buck that trend and and set an example and make those sort of ordinary story women more comfortable sharing, which will help balance things out. When it's your turn, stand up and tell about something ordinary God has done in your life. You know, uh, I'm so thankful that with everything I could be going through, God is giving, has given me smooth sailing in X, Y, and Z areas of my life right now. Or I've been studying the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm so thankful to God for A, B, and C things He has shown shown me and taught me. You know, things like that. Now, it's also possible that the drama has reached an unbiblical or unhealthy level. Maybe it feels like everyone is trying to one-up each other, you know, each with a more dramatic story than the last. Perhaps some women are even tempted to lie or embellish their stories for the praise of man. Maybe the focus has been taken off of God and redirected to the to the drama or the woman telling the story. I really hope none of those things are the case, but if any or all of those things are true, it's probably time to have a lesson on the purpose of testimonies and how to give a testimony, namely that the purpose is to bring God glory and to put our focus on Him, to be truthful, and that the little things God does in our lives are just as important as the big things. So I would encourage you to spend some time prayerfully thinking about all of those things. You know, consider whether or not you simply need to be more understanding of women God created differently than He created you, or whether things have gotten out of whack biblically and you need to talk to whoever's in charge of the meeting before the next share day. Amy, any additional thoughts on that one? Yeah, you know, emotionalism is a hard one to discern because we don't know, you know, the minds of the people who are feeling these things. Uh, we don't know what their motives are, but I, I will say I have been to uh, those kinds of testimonial meetings in my past where it is highly emotional. I, and I also have a hard time with it because um, I'm not a person who's prone to tears uh, in those situations. And I have to ask myself, why aren't I crying when everyone else is, you know, so <laughs> maybe there's something wrong with my ordinariness, I guess. So, uh, so I, I really like what you said about that, Michelle. But, you know, we can still, even if we're not feeling, uh, the way other people are expressing themselves, we can still have enormous empathy to grieve with those who grieve and to come alongside with prayers and hugs and a listening ear, all of those things that sisters do for each other. Well, I think, Michelle, that that is going to do it for this episode of Glad You Asked uh, here at A Word Fitly Spoken. Don't forget to drop by our website, awordfitlyspoken.life, to support us financially or find our social media pages and check out all of our other resources. And until next time, be sure to get all the answers to your questions from Scripture and walk worthy.